Welcome, welcome back to Crafting a Meaningful Life. I'm your host, Mary Crafts, and I have a very special guest today, my dear, dear friend, Jeff O'Driscoll. Let's just welcome him right away and get him on the camera. Jeff, welcome, welcome. Good to be with you again, Mary. Thanks for having me. So this is your second time on my podcast. There's only one other person. Well, that's not true. Two other people out of my 340 guests that have ever been on twice. So that must mean you're amazing. Well, I feel I feel very privileged. <laughs> well, it's privileged because you're you're amazing. Um, and the reason I wanted to have you on the podcast today is because you've published this new book, which is a pretty phenomenal step in your transition and your growth in life. And what I think it has to offer my listeners is that this kind of inward progression and thinking is available to all of us. In the world that we live in, Jeff, I see most people trying to control what's out here and we're failing miserably at it. But if we shift and we begin to be who we want to be, not who we want them to be, (laughs) but who we want to be, who I want to be, then we begin to shift and make major transformations in our life. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes. Yes. Uh, It's so much about refocusing on what's inside and who we are and balancing the emphasis, not just of what we're becoming and what we want to be, but balancing it with what we are and living in the present yeah. and giving value and place to what we are right now. And it's and it's even what we have always been. I think that's the big awareness for me that it's a matter of just sitting and being the awareness of who I have always been. Yeah. And and when you get to that point where you can honor that part of yourself then you can look at all those around you and you can honor them in the same way. You can release judgment and you can accept people the way they yeah. are and love them just as they are. I think that's the biggest thing that I love about you is that I feel completely seen in front of you and yet I also feel completely accepted. Do you remember the first time we met? I do. I looked across the room and I saw you. Uh, I had I had seen you on social media, and right. when our eyes connected, I thought I am going to have a conversation with this woman. I I am going to get to know this person. That is exactly what I thought. I had seen you on social media. You were a friend of our good friends Tiffany Peterson, and uh, I thought that guy has some substance. I I would like to know him. But that day at the Salt Lake Library, when I saw you and you saw me, there was this instant, I see you and you have value to me. Yeah, and we just like, whoa, like two magnets came together. And we've been sharing uh, Eggs Benedict breakfast together ever since. (laughs) Yes, eggs Benedict. Yes, I was speaking at the Leonardo, and I think that that first time we met, I think you had just. Oh, that's right. It was the Leonardo. Kilimanjaro. Yeah. Yes, uh, Jeff was an emergency room physician for how many years? Twenty-five. Twenty-five years, and uh, I tell you, I can't even hardly spend thirty minutes in that emergency room without going into some sort of place that I don't like because there's so much trauma. There's a lot of drama as well. And the last time I went to an emergency room, there were uh, shooting victims coming in. There were 23 police in the emergency room and one of them died. And then they brought in reinforcements because they were afraid the gangs were going to fight in the parking lot. And I just thought, I'm leaving. There is not healing here for me. And I left. I just said to the nurse, I'm leaving. (laughs) 
<laughs> Whatever is wrong with me, I can wait. This is like... And to be in that scenario for 25 years, Jeff, how did you get through 25 years as an ER doctor? Some days were really rough and some days were really spectacular. Uh -huh. And uh, the spectacular days sustained me through the tough days. The days okay. when uh, you could really make a difference in somebody's life and they were appreciative. Or the days when, uh, as you know, sometimes I had profoundly spiritual experiences in the emergency yeah. department. And uh, those days were very sustaining. Uh, and. It's amazing how far down the path naivete will get you. You know, you, you go into certain explain, parts of your explain. life not knowing. <laughs> and it gets you along the path. Okay. So what is it that you came to know after your naivete was done that really has led you to the path you are today? Well, um... I had just one experience as an example that I share in my book, Not Yet, in my memoir about my time in the ER. Um, I, I walked into a room one day, and uh, this homeless gentleman was sitting on the gurney. Um, it was in November, I think, and he had cold, wet feet. He'd been walking around in the snow for a prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. and he had holes in his shoes. He had a long, scruffy beard and unkempt hair. It, he struggled with substance use, and uh, he was in rough shape. Yeah. And we didn't talk very much. Uh, we both knew what needed to be done. I grabbed a wash basin and filled it full of warm water and squirted some soap in it, and I sat down at the foot of the gurney with a wash rag, and I took off his shoes, and I removed the last threads of his socks, and I washed his feet. And in the process of doing that, something profound happened. Everything that was physical or mortal or temporal about this person was drawn aside and I saw his soul. And I was in the yeah. presence of the divine. I thought I had gone in the, into the room to care for him and I quickly realized that he was there ministering to me. He was teaching me who I was by showing me who he was. He was the antithesis of everything the world defines as success, and yet he was divine. And I viewed every soul differently since that day because I finally realized that it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in the pews at church or in the gutter, the person next to you is God, and that's who you are as well. You know, I remember that day when I met you and you saw me. That's how you saw me. I knew it. You saw me as not just Mary Crafts who had climbed Kilimanjaro and was now known as a badass. That was all set aside. And you saw me, Mary, the divine. And it's a profound experience to be in your presence, Jeff. It is. I would like to say that I see people that way. I certainly see people more that way now. And I'm much more in tune with their souls because I know you. And that's been a great gift. Thank you. And I remember see, being with you when you saw more of yourself that way once over lunch. And yes. I asked you one simple question and I just saw your whole countenance change and you got emotional and uh, and you realized a new facet and depth of your own soul that allows you to accept yourself more fully as you are and as you yeah. were at the time. Yeah. That stepping into love of self is pretty profound when it happens. And it's one thing, I think, for... I remember for me walking through those pathways of actually genuinely loving myself and my soul. And now, as someone who's become very health aware and wellness aware, 
It's easy for me to say, and I love my body. But it was a whole different step for me, Jeff, when just two and a half years ago, this is, not, this is very recent, when I heard Oprah talking about loving her body from the time she was little, and I went, oh, no, wait, no, that's, that's too much. You can't. <laughs> I mean, I can love my body now, but I don't love my body then. In fact, I'm so glad to get away from it. What are we talking about? You know? But to listen to her and to realize that was my next step to, to loving all of me was to love all of me at all times and in all ways. And as I was taking off my clothes in front of the mirror and wrapping my arms around myself, and weeping to fall in love with who I have always been was a profound movement for me and step into loving all of me. I, I love that. I love that you did that and that you shared that. You know, uh, in, the, in the Christian New Testament, there's a verse of scripture that says that uh, it, it's a commandment actually to love your neighbor as yourself. And people talk a lot about loving their neighbor, but they don't talk much about loving themselves. And in fact, they kind of push it off. They think it's almost <clears throat> a, uh, a rationalization to love yourself as you are when you have such a long way to go to become what you think you, sh you should be. Yeah. And we forget sometimes that it's not a rationalization. It's a commandment. Love yourself. And... Most of the time when you accept uh, an imperative from heaven, you acknowledge that uh, it's something you should do right away, not long in the future. Right, And the only exactly. way to love yourself as you are, the only way to love yourself today is to love yourself as you are. That's the only you that exists. You can love next week's version of yourself next week and next year's version of yourself next year. But the only way to honor loving yourself today is to love yourself as you are. And it's okay to do that. In the infinite now. Yes. I used to think that living in the now was a, was a cliche. And then I realized that a lot of my most profound experiences um, and the ones that I look forward to in the future can only exist in the present. I can remember a profound experience in my past and learn from it. And I can hope for and prepare for divine and profound experiences in my future. But the only way I can experience the divine is in the present. That's the only place I am. Yeah, that's right. Because we may never get to tomorrow. <laughs> we don't know. But when we do get there, it may not be in this form. We may be in a different sphere of life and so now is the most important in in my morning meditations I do this thing where I actually hold my hands in front of my face to get me to focus on what is right here this moment right now and I don't move them until I'm really aware of everything that is happening in that moment and then the next moment and the next moment and it really brings me to now. Okay, so we know what you've been doing as an, uh, you were a, a retired emergency room physician. We know that you wrote your first book, not yet, but Jeff, you've written a new book now that steps even beyond, in my opinion, anything that you've currently done. Do you have a copy of the book with you? I do. Oh, let's see it, because I want everyone to see the cover. Let's show it. There it is. Oh my gosh. See, doesn't that book, that book cover just invites me to walk into it. Um, would you read what's on the cover? Well, I can actually tell you what's on the cover, but would you hold it up again? Because I want people to look at it as I say it. This is Zen's garden. And I think the, ex I think the words are an em a physician's journey to beyond science or something like that. Tell me the exact words. Well, the image I emailed you 
sometime in the past had that subtitle, but I deleted that subtitle, and the cover of the book now actually does not have a subtitle. Well, there you go. Oh, I love the subtitle. Okay, but that's okay. Maybe it's on the back. <laughs> but that idea that here was a scientific person, such as yourself, a doctor, Western medicine trained, had been an ER doctor for 25 years. And then how your journey, your path in life has been to move beyond the science to something else. And that's what I would like you to share with my listeners, that process. I know we can't read the whole book here. And the link to the, buy the book on Amazon is at the end of the program, as well as Jeff's website and things so that you can connect with Jeff. But tell me about that journey from science to living in Zen's garden. Well, as you know, I had a lot of profound experiences in the emergency department things that science yeah. couldn't explain. And uh, I sometimes saw souls leave their bodies when they died, and they'd communicate with me before they left this realm. And so when I set out to write this book, it's a novel, it's fiction, but you know what they say, write what you know. And so this book is about an emergency physician coming to terms with the uh, experiences he has in the emergency department that science can't explain. And interestingly enough, uh, it's set in Utah, which is where I live. And uh, I didn't have to do any research at all to write the book. Uh, it's that familiar, of course. But the one part of the book that was purely fiction and the inciting event that sent this physician on his hero's journey, if you will, was the, the, the unexpected death of his adult daughter. And her name was Zen. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's part of where the title comes from. The, the main character's name is Solace Murphy. It's an Irish name, and uh, I'm Irish. Uh, O'Driscoll couldn't be. Oh, more. really? Huh? Go figure, O'Driscoll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm Irish. <laughs> I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you recently visited Ireland. I did. That's where John and I got married. And to discover that I was 25% Irish was the biggest thrill for me because I've always wanted to be Irish. Yeah, I visited Ireland quite a few years ago. I took my youngest son for his high school graduation, and nobody once, our whole trip, asked us to spell our name. It's a very common name over there. Yeah. So this book I wrote, um, I still remember the day that Solace is talking to his wife. It's about five years after his, their daughter has passed, and he's just heartbroken. He looks at his wife, and he said, God, I love that kid. And I remember when I wrote that line, I just broke down and wept because it felt so personal and so visceral. And I wondered, why does that feel so deeply in me? And uh, I finished writing the book. I set it aside. And my father's health took a turn for the worse. And I went and lived at my parents' house for about six weeks and provided his end-of-life care. And he passed away a year ago in May. And a week after my father's funeral, my 32-year-old daughter was diagnosed with uh, terminal lung cancer. And about halfway through last summer, as I was helping her in, through her last six months of life, she passed away in November. And I remember last summer remembering that line from the book and the day I wrote it. And my jaw just dropped open. I thought, how could this be? And... Uh, and I had a working title for the novel. It had Solace's name in the title. The, the working title was Finding Solace. But I knew if I used that title, I'd have to be spelling S-O-L-A-S, his last name, as opposed to the word we're typically thinking of, Solace. And I knew it wasn't going to work quite right, so I, I wasn't going to use it. And I didn't know what to use for a title. And I remember picking up uh, the manuscript uh, shortly after my daughter's passing and thinking, well, I guess maybe I should still publish this and what am I going to call it? And I heard my, I heard Rachel's voice say, Zen's Garden. And it just hit me like a brick in the head. I said, of course. It's not about Solace's journey. It's about Zen's tutelage. 
And I understood solace was her garden. Her father was her garden. She was cultivating in him uh, a spiritual uh, harvest, if you will. And I put the name Zen's Garden. I titled it Zen's Garden and published it. Wow. Having explained all of that, that gives the title a whole different meaning. Yeah, she was working from beyond the veil to cultivate in her father something bigger and deeper and more meaningful. Whose mission was not yet finished, even though hers was and that she went on to do something else and in a different place and realm. But yours is not done, Jeff, here. Uh, as I looked at the cover, one of the things that struck me is that being a hiker, I'm always looking to check my direction and path by searching for the Cairns. And Cairns are these stacks of rocks, you know, a, a big one, a little one. And when you see one, you know that's the direction that you should go. Was there any significance in using that particular image on the cover? Yes, it. Um, I, I very intentionally designed the cover because I wanted people to feel something when they looked at it. I wanted them to look at the cover and want to get inside. And uh, the cover depicts an experience that Solace has at Hana on the island of Maui. And ah, uh, the road to Hana. He has this in, yeah, he has this incredible <laughs> experience on the beach. And he takes three smooth stones and he stacks them one on top of each other. And then he takes a stick and he draws these lines in the sand around the car and out into the ocean. And then he walks out into the ocean and becomes one with the universe, if you will. And, and so the cover depicts that experience that Solace had. Wow. 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 So more than just simply pointing the way, it was his way. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Um, and and that, was, that was kind of his big realization as he went along was he realized that the things that we so often strive to be, we, when we get a little bit more spiritually mature, we realize that's what we already are. And we... Uh, you know, we we look at the things that help us along our path. You know, we look at the path markers, the currents, the the religious symbols, uh, the the things we do yeah. in our life to help us along the path until we realize, wait a minute, the pres my presence in the moment, in the now, is my path. Every time I'm alert and awake and truly engaged, that is the path. Yeah. Yeah. We don't sometimes we spend so much time I spend so much time searching for the path that I don't realize I am the path. <laughs> you are the path. And yeah. and the problem is is that in so many cultures and religious traditions we're conditioned to think that there's one path that there's only one path that it looks exactly like this and if 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 somebody's doing something that doesn't conform with your idea of the path then they must be off the path, and it's virtually impossible not to judge them as a consequence. Oh, yes. Whew. And I'll give you a perfect example from, uh, from uh, Christianity. A lot of our viewers are, have a Christian background. Uh, there, was a, there was a character in the New Testament, his name was Saul. He was a pretty rough uh, dude. In fact, the King James Version of the Bible says that he was wreaking havoc in the church, that's the word they use, and consenting to the death of the apostles. I've never met anybody that thought Saul was on his path, on the right path. And yet his path led him smack dab into the face of the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. And Saul asked him two questions. He said, well, who are you first? And then he said, well, what do you want me to do? And this started Saul on the on the path to become Paul the Apostle, who literally mm. wrote the book on Christianity. Yeah. The, 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 most of the epistles in the New Testament are written by Paul. And this is my point. 
everything that Saul was and everything that Saul did made him Paul. It enabled him to be what he became. And there was value yes. in all of it. And we judge Saul's path and think it wrong when in fact, no, it wasn't. It was exactly what Saul needed to be Paul. I think we all can look back and see that. At least for me, I look at my past and I think, I am so grateful for every single step, every struggle, every misthought, because it's, it's those things that led me to now, my now today. I wouldn't have this now if I hadn't had every single one of those other nows in my life. And how could I not be grateful for that struggle? For How could I not be grateful for my path if this is where it's leading me? And I don't know what's out here in front of me, Jeff, um, but I know whatever it is that will lead to my next now when I know myself even more. Right. There's so much gratitude. So much gratitude. And, and part of that realization and that, and that sol solace, if you will, that you can find, comes from realizing that perfection is not a static state in the future. Perfection right. is a dynamic state in the presence, present. We're not going through steps of becoming perfect. We are going through states of being perfect. Oh. Can you say that one more time? I think that's so profound. We are not going through states. Let me say it again. We are not going through steps of becoming perfect. We are going through states of being perfect. Of being perfect. Because like perfection that. is not a static state in the future. Yeah. yeah. Perfection is a dynamic state in the present. Because I have as my purpose in life, I mean, I have a vision, I have a mission, I have a purpose. And I see my purpose as to be my very best self. And when that happens, then I intuitively and automatically want the same for others. And then lift myself and others at the same, in the same lift. But knowing that I will never reach that my best self. Today is my best self, but tomorrow is going to be my better self. And 10 right. years from now, it's going to be amazing. And, you know, a thousand years from now, it's going to be like incredible. And that every day is it's a journey. It's a path to finding what that best self looks like. And I, right. I love the journey. I love the journey. And it's so important that we realize tomorrow's perfection doesn't negate today's perfection. The right. fact that you change and evolve is, is expected. That's what you're here for. That's what we're doing. But the person you are next week, if you're perfect next week, doesn't mean that you're less perfect today. It's just a different yeah. st state of perfection for a different set of circumstances that exists in a separate time mm. and place. Yep. So much wisdom in that little little bit of brain and head and you. How could so much be encapsulated in that person that you are? I'm just always amazed that this your your size of your brain is well within relative measurements, the close to the same size as my brain. But what I love about your brain, Jeff is that we know that within the folds of our brain lies so many untouched areas, so much unused potential in those folds. And I have this feeling about you that you have taken the deep dive into so many of the folds of your brain to understand what you've always known. And I, I, I look up to you for that. You talked a few moments ago about how uh, you, you're looking outward to help others. When, when you reach a certain state of awareness and, and comfort and confidence with yourself, you can look outward and help others. And 
I had that come home very powerfully to me one day when a messenger came to me and said, every experience is to enable you to help someone else. And I thought, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought experiences were for personal growth. And then I could go help other people if I wanted to. And the messenger said, the primary purpose of every experience is to enable you to help someone else. You get the secondary benefit of personal growth. And it was a 180 degree flip about the purpose for the difficult experiences we have in life. They're to teach us empathy so that we can help others. And, uh, you know, it's, we don't have to worry so much about ourselves if we're in the present and in the moment and, and, and helping others along the way because the experience is the most difficult, the most painful, you know this, I think we've talked about this, the most painful, yeah. grueling, difficult experiences in your past make you a light that enables you to stand up and speak and people listen and they say, oh, she gets it. I can trust her. I'm going to listen to what she has to say. And it's because of the, the hard things that you went through that you're able to have that voice. Yeah. Precisely. <laughs> all right, Jeff, I want you to share with people, um, if you, first of all, let me acknowledge that I, I just can't even put my, my arms around the fact that you wrote this book about the death of Solace's daughter, whose name was Zen. And then, within a short time, you were face to face with that journey in your personal life. Be careful what you write from now on. Can I just say but, that? You know, that is that. just uh, unbelievable, Jeff. And that you were able to go ahead and publish this book. So I don't even know how to address I, that. I've never been one really that looks for signs or sees signs, you know, dragonflies, yeah. butterflies, rainbows, those kind of things. Uh, that's never Coming really words. been my thing. But um, within, literally within a couple minutes of my daughter's passing, uh, there was this profound experience with a rainbow. Uh, and, and the amazing thing was that this rainbow which witnesses told me was centered right over our house at the moment. It wasn't raining. And as you know, I live in the desert. It wasn't raining. And people stopped and took pictures of the rainbow. My daughter's husband had gone home briefly to pick up a few things and come back, and she passed away while he was driving back to our house. And he was one of the ones that came in and just was stunned by this rainbow. And uh, so happens that the day before he had leaned down, the, the day that the oncologist said, uh, I think it's time for us to consider hospice. And uh, I was there and her husband leaned down and whispered something in her ear at that moment. And we took her home. She was on hospice care for only 24 hours in my house. And uh, I found out the next day that what my son-in-law had whispered in Rachel's ear was he'd asked her after she passed to please send him a sign that she was okay. And he accepted that rainbow as that sign. And my younger, younger daughter, that's two years younger than Rachel, texted me the night that Rachel passed. And uh, she told me that she had felt bad that, that Todd wasn't there when Rachel passed away. And then she heard a voice say, if he'd been there, he wouldn't have seen my rainbow. Um, if he'd have been at her bedside, he wouldn't have seen the sign that she gave him. Um, How so I had all these that? experiences with rainbows. Yeah. I could tell you a dozen profound experiences with rainbows. And so I'm getting ready to publish Zen's Garden. And I picked up the manuscript and I looked at it. And I thought maybe I should give this one last look before I send it to the publisher because I hadn't read it for a long time. And uh, I started reading a chapter where Solace comes home from work. And for the first time in five years, he opens Zen's bedroom door and goes into her bedroom. 
And uh, he picks up a bottle of perfume that he bought her in Paris, and he spritzes it in the air. And he sits down in the middle of the bedroom, and he starts to feel Zen's presence, which didn't happen to him. He was not a spiritual guy. He didn't have those experiences. But as he experienced Zen's presence, he looked at the far wall of the bedroom, and the beveled glass windows were casting rainbows all across the far window or the far room of the that far wall of the room. And as I read, I'd forgotten about that. I, as I read it, I just wept. And I heard my daughter's voice say, "You wrote your own sign, Dad. I'm just honoring it." Oh my gosh! How beautiful. Mm. This is a book everyone is going to want to read as they walk through their journeys to finding self and then the connection, the connection to others. And what I really appreciate, Jeff, is that you are willing to be vulnerable enough to share not just your book that you wrote, but its personal connection to your life. And the journey, it is a, simply a memoir of the journey you walked but written before you walked it. Wow. Like I said, you've been in there exploring all those folds in your brain. <laughs> you were... I keep discovering new ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you for your time today, Jeff. And thank you for being with me always. Whenever I am in your presence, it's just such a rich, fulfilling experience to see you and to have you know that I see you and I see you as you are and love just where you are because it has been such a profound influence in my life as well. And even when we go times without seeing each other, I always know you're there, that I could reach out anytime and you would see me again. Thanks, Mary. I, I love you. I love being with you. Um, I, I, I love the wisdom you share. I love the voice that you use to help so many people. And uh, it's really an honor to share a few minutes with you. Likewise. All right, my dear friends, this is part of crafting a meaningful life, that you are aware of who you are and who you've always been. That person is the person that guides you every single day. Spend time to get to know that person. Reach inside the folds of your brain because that's the person that you are and have always been. Thank you for being with me, Jeff. Crafting a Meaningful Life.